What percentage of your, wait, what is it? What percentage of your improvisation is harmonically conscious? That question came from Robert inside the forum in my virtual studio. It's a great question and I responded in there, but it really is something I've been thinking about the past couple days, especially as I'm going through all the uh, the catalog of snarky puppy music to re-memorize that for the Ground Up Festival this weekend. By the way, if you haven't seen it, and there's a good chance you haven't, uh, a while back I wrote a couple blog posts about how, one of them was called How I Memorized 20 Plus Snarky Puppy Songs in One Week, and the method in there is, it's a very strong method. I'm using an abridged form of that right now where instead of using the Kanban or Kanban style board, I've just got a board with the uh, the titles on it, and then I just use a check mark to say like, okay, I went over this song once or twice or three times, whatever, and it helps me visually to just kind of feel like I'm making progress, and I can really start to see, okay, wow, that this song I've only been over once, but the others I've been over three times, etc. But this idea of memorizing music is important because in terms of answering that question, what percentage of my, of your improvisation is harmonically conscious? Well, the more that, or the less familiar you are with a song, the more, the more difficult it's going to be to be truly spontaneous in the moment. I think, it, at least for me, it takes a ton of repetition and muscle memory so that something can fade far enough into the background where I don't have to think about it sort of top of mind. And then I can devote the majority of my brain power and my attention to making music in the moment. But if something is completely unfamiliar, it's much harder to do that. Case in point, I have a gig tonight with a, a group of guys, great young group of guys, Mike Raganese's band. I'm probably saying your last name wrong. <laughs> playing at the Blue Whale tonight should you be in LA and see this video in time. The music is fantastic, but it's music that I just got two days ago. We rehearsed it yesterday, we're gonna play it tonight. There's not time to memorize it, plus it's multiple pages long and it changes time signatures and there's a lot going on in it and the chord changes are difficult. <laughs> So that's a different skill set, and it's fairly impossible for me to be at the same level of comfort, for instance, playing that, and sort of mental detachment, as it were, as it's going to be for me playing a blues, which I, which I, you know, is sort of ingrained in my DNA at this point, and like this snarky puppy material, which I've now been playing, recording, and playing over the course of years. And while I'm not touring with Snarky all the time, so what happens is I'll do a tour and I'll know all the music great and then it kind of fades away and then when something's coming up again, I have to just kind of, I do a couple cram sessions and just re, you know get it all back in there. But it happens so much faster and so much easier because I initially learned the music by ear and not from reading it. I have a very difficult time memorizing music if it's gonna come to me from the page. It's just like, once I, I see it on paper, it's just hard for me to make that leap. And this is something I, I hear and see a lot of times with people who are transitioning from a more classical uh, environment. A lot of saxophone players will ask me like, I don't, you know, how do I make that transition from classical to jazz? And I think one of the biggest hangups is just getting over the hump of understanding that this is music that you wanna make with your ears, not with your eyes. So it's, you gotta get off the page as soon as possible, all the time. So if you wanna learn a tune, the best thing in my opinion to do is, let's say you are reading the tune out of a real book or whatever, an Abersol, read the tune, fine, but as soon as, as you can, get off the page. So maybe read it down once and then see if, can you turn around and can you still play it without looking at the paper? Maybe you do that a section at a time, but it's fine, get off, make a mistake, and then it, it will just trigger you using your ears much faster. I find it helpful to use um, like some looping software. I mean, back in the day, I used to do it with a CD player with A, B, repeat, but now I use a program called the Amazing Slow Downer. Ironically, I do not use it for slowing the music down. I just use it for its handy loop feature and for the fact that I can save little segments. So let's say I'm working on, a, on one of these snarky tunes, which has a lot of sections, I'll just like, you know, I'll basically find a small part and I'll I'll identify that one, like melody one or melody two or, you know, solely something like that. 
and I'll make it, I'll save that little loop and it just saves me time later on. I can just go back and hit that and start playing along and it's just looping, looping, looping and it's that repetition that now allows that stuff to sink in whereby I don't have to think about it so much in the moment. If you're thinking about it, it it's gonna be really hard to also be spontaneous and natural. Another example, the stuff I'm doing with Jay Jennings' band, which we're also playing at Ground Up this weekend. Uh, you know, I, there's some of that that I have memorized now, and I've worked to, to get off the page with that. I'm not off the page with all of it, but it makes it so much more enjoyable because I can really tune into connecting with him in a different way and just all the nuances and the dynamics. And there's just a lot of things I can focus on when I'm not thinking about what my eyes are seeing and, and fo focusing on reading music. <laughs> So, you know, again, the thing I'm doing tonight, that's that's a different animal and that requires a different skill set. And I would also say that years of experience playing in ensembles, playing in different people's bands, like lots and lots of reading and soloing in new environments, that is the the for me the only real training to getting better at that actual thing, which is how do you how do you read something for the first time and at least make it somewhat come off as if you've been playing it as long as you've been playing a blues or something with that level of comfort. It's a bit of a magic show, really. It's sort of smoke and mirrors. I don't think, I was certainly not able to do it earlier on, like when I was just getting started. It's just impossible. You know, it's just, there are layers, right, of development. So anyway, just something to think about. I would just encourage you to get off the page always and as soon as possible. If there's a tune you're learning, learn it by ear. I, I'm not saying don't learn it on paper, but fine, look at a lead sheet or something, but just try to get off the paper as soon as possible. It's an it's not just something you wanna do with you know transcribing solos, and that's a word that gets bandied about a lot. I certainly use it as a shorthand for the practice of copying, lifting solos and playing along with them, but I don't mean writing them down on paper. You just want to be learning as much music as you can with your ear as your guiding compass, not your eyes, if that makes sense. It just accesses, and it accesses entire different parts of your mind, and those are the parts of your mind you want to be accessing as an improvising musician. So yeah, I gotta get busy. I've got a bunch of music to learn for tonight's gig, and then tomorrow night I have the baked potato with my band. I'll get home from that around 2 a.m., and then I gotta go to the airport at 3.30 a.m. for a 6 a.m. flight on Friday morning, get to Miami, and then play that night with Snarky, and then at 2.50 a.m. in the morning, play with Jay's band, and then at 12 o'clock on Saturday, I'm playing with a vocalist whose name I can't pronounce yet, Alina. Uh, I'm not even gonna try. And then Snarky, Saturday night, Sunday night. It's gonna be great. I, I hope to see you there, um, some of you. Also, I have now fully reviewed the mixes. I chose the song order. I think I even have the title for this new album of mine, the one with Yannick and Sean and Ruslan. It's been sent off to mastering. I even got a first pass of that back. So I just got the first master pass back, meaning the first mastering pass of the mixes. So this is the first time I'm gonna hear the song order uh, as a whole flow and just like the, the spacing and time before a song starts mo and mostly uh, after a song ends. Just made some notes about spacing, so I'm waiting on the second pass of the master. That will then go to the, vi the videos are done, but that will go to Alex who's doing the videos and then it's it's, Close, it's not ready to go yet, but uh, there's definitely more steps in the process, but it's very, very close. The album will be coming out within the next couple of months, and the tour is happening in May, still in the UK and Europe, and as I mentioned a few vlogs ago, you know, I think it's still okay to be hitting those guys up at Good Music Company if there's a place you wanna see us in Europe, if there's a city you'd like us to come perform in. I think we're getting close to locking down the tour, but I'll leave a link below this video if you wanna reach out to those guys, and, um, that's it for now. I guess I will see you either in Miami or after. <laughs> Hudson, would you say that maybe we had a couple of different ideas of what the tempo should have been on that tune? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so.